seated. The Gospels are full of stories of individual people who encounter Jesus. And it's my belief that many of us have been trained to hear these Gospel moments in a particular way. We assume that the person who is encountering Jesus does so out of need. Growth, healing, forgiveness, whatever it is, it's always something. Something is desperately needed or desired, and Jesus either gives them what they need, challenges them, or changes their focus. And ultimately, that does happen to this morning's Samaritan woman. She indeed has a need that Jesus recognizes, and she changes her focus. But the journey is unique for the Gospels. She does not come looking for Jesus, and she originally asks nothing of him. In fact, it's the other way around. It is Jesus who asks her for a drink of water. He's the one that's thirsty. She's the one with a jar, able to give him a drink. Anna Carter Florence writes that in his asking the woman for a drink, Jesus gives her the chance to recognize the face of Christ in a stranger. She writes, there is something beautifully simple in the staging of the scene as well as its premise. Jesus is thirsty at the well. And we are the ones with the bucket. The deeper metaphorical conversation that follows makes no sense until we take this in. Can a little tin, like a cup of cool water offered in love, be the beginning of a salvation journey? Now, I want to quote one of those lines again, because I've heard this statement so many times, and to the day, it still remains shocking to me. Jesus is thirsty at the well. We are the ones with the bucket. Think about that. That changes everything else we hear of Jesus. Being the one who constantly provides. The colleague this morning says we have nothing to help ourselves. But that's not what happens here. Jesus is the one that is thirsty. We are the ones with the bucket. In the gospel, the woman responds, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And the text comments, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Just in case the reader doesn't know this, because it's absolutely critical to the story. Now, I come to a decision that she asked him this question after. Now the text doesn't say one way or the other, but I personally believe, as Anna Clark Florence sort of assumes, that it's in the sharing of water where the conversation happens. Water leads to dialogue. She's perplexed, to be sure, but I'm pretty sure she gives him something to drink. You know, her words remind me of Mary to the angel Gabriel in Luke's Gospel. Gabriel came to her and said, Greetings, favorite one, the Lord is with you, but Mary was left perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. As the text says, Jews don't share things with Samaritans. Jewish men aren't even supposed to talk with Samaritan women, much less share a drink of water. Most would have rather died of thirst than interact in this way. And Jesus clearly is a bad person for water. The woman rightly senses that this is no ordinary encounter. Jesus says, if you knew the gift 
gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This is, of course, quite a statement. And she looks him over, and shrewdly declares that he has no pocket to get this living water from the well. But unlike Nicodemus, who stays in the liberal, she pushes the issue. Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? She reminds Jesus of both their common ancestry and their difference, all in one statement. There's a willingness to engage him, but a clear understanding that she is faithful to her traditions. Jesus answers, those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. And showing faith, she takes a step further. Give me this water stays in openness to be transformed if he can do as he says. Again, she echoes Mary's will willingness to say yes to God. But then comes the odd twist. At least it seems like it to us. Jesus invites her to, quote, go, call your husband and come back. To which she replies, I have no husband. And Jesus agrees. You have had five husbands. What you have now is not your husband. And that confuses modern readers. We have been taught to conclude, oh, she's that type. <laughs> Numerous interpreters, as they have done with Mary Magdalene, have encouraged a negative, sin-filled viewpoint of her life. But David Welsh reminds us that Jesus at no point invites her to be or for that matter, speaks of sin at all. There is nothing in this text that makes it about sex. It's about marriage in the first century world, and that needs exploring. Because understand, the only way for this woman to have had five previous husbands is death, abandonment, or divorce. And all of these would have happened to her rather than the chosen. Because women do not have autonomy in marriage of their own. The one who currently is not her husband is likely one of two possibilities. Lois reminds us of the likely reality here of Leverite marriage, where a childless woman is married to her deceased husband's brother in order to produce an heir, yet is not always technically considered the brother's wife. Or, she may have been forced into becoming someone's mistress. Remember, she has come alone, draw water from a well at noon. No one would choose noon as a time to go to get water under the hot and heated sun. We can assume she was not welcome in the morning when the other married women came to the well. This woman's story reeks of tragedy rather than scandal. And the dialogue, the dialogue shows the woman how much Jesus really sees. Not only does he know the specifics, five marriages now gone, Jesus sees how she and most of the women of her time are caught in a society of dependence. He sees how their identity is based on marriage circumstance and how vulnerable this makes them in society. David Willis concludes that she recognizes not just who Jesus is, but what he offers. Dignity. Jesus invites her not to be defined by her circumstances and offers her an identity that lifts her above her tragedy. 
She responds, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you said that the place where people must worship is Jerusalem. The key to understanding these words comes with a comparison. Consider this in the light of last week's encounter with Nicodemus, chapter before. There we have a learned, powerful male insider. And today we have an unnamed outsider, a five-time married woman. The Pharisee Nicodemus, a man of religious and economic power, seeks Jesus out under the cover of darkness and fails to understand him. It is amazing that Nicodemus asked how these things be. But the Samaritan woman, the wrong faith, the wrong gender, with no wealth nor power, in a shameful, tragic position in her community, engages Jesus in the light at his choosing. She understands his words, and in the midst of her amazement, expresses faith. And it's only our lack of context that clouds her response. Is she mistaking Jesus for a prophet? Is she attempting in some strange way to change the subject from her marriage status? No! Her response to Jesus is an enlightened one and speaks to the reality of the late first century and second century community gathered in Jesus' name. She recognizes Jesus as a prophet, authority which he clearly has. And her question about worshiping on the mountain addresses the ancient argument between Samaritans and Jews. She looks to him to address what has become a terrible divide that has led to hatred of siblings. What are we supposed to do with this endless debate? Jesus, a faithful Jew, says, Yes, I believe God dwells in the great temple in Jerusalem. I believe in our path. But the day is coming when all of our differences, all of the things we held on so dearly to, melt away. When we become a new community, as God hopes for us all. The Samaritan, with insight, puts it all together. I know the sign is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us, and Jesus speaks clearly to her. I am he, the one who is seeking. You see, the unnamed Samaritan woman who first gave Jesus a drink of water, now then, leaves that precious jar behind because she now is the vessel. She has the living water to carry back to her community. She is the first in John's Gospel to tell others to come see the Messiah and the reconciler of the whole world. And as she goes, and the disciples urge Jesus to eat, Jesus just sits there, filled. Because that's why he was there. The encounters of transformation like that, that is what he's all about. Pointing to that community of John's Gospel, where Jew and Greek, Samaritan, Woman, man, male, female, everyone invited in relationship with God and Christ. I want to conclude by going back to that provocative statement from Anna Carter Florence. Jesus is thirsty at the well. We are the ones 
in the bucket. Our model in all of this, but with no authority, who is engaged by Jesus, is that unnamed, unlikely woman. And as she gives him a drink, she is open not only to a new way of being herself, but empowered to become the bearer of living water for others. And that is the news for us. We are called to bring, in the midst of our difference, without any need to believe the same way,